Uh, praise the Lord, brethren. Thank you for staying bye, tuned. Bye, uh, bye, we're just going to continue bye, with our series on giving and receiving. And uh, as I've mentioned previously, that we've covered tithing already, and the videos are on our Facebook page. You can uh, you have full access to them. And we've also covered uh, offerings as well, uh, season offerings, and that's also available. And we've also covered on the true nature of seed sowing. So now we're dealing with first fruits, okay? And we see where the Lord leads us, and the Holy Spirit intends to guide us uh, with this uh, knowledge that has been in existence all this while. It's not new. It's just that we have not given it you know, um, in, enough attention to unearth the details that are compatible with the doctrine of Christ so that we can, you know, order ourselves right when it comes to what we are being asked to do as the word of God tells us. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we start with part one, um, and then part two. So we're going to move on to part three because we're trying to give as much information, but we've been, you know, a short space of time so that it is easily digested. Amen? That facilitates our learning. Okay. So we ended, yes, the last, last session on the... On the fruit of the, of the fruit of the Holy Spirit being uh, one of the, uh, the, the the signs or indicators of first fruit, you know, a connotation that is. Yeah. So we had sign of productivity, we had results and achievement, we had offspring, uh, meaning uh, um, birthing of new new life. And we had uh, the nature of the Holy Spirit. So we're connecting first fruit to the nature of the Holy Spirit. And we had uh, two, two scriptures uh, to refer to that. Uh, Proverbs 11.30 and Galatians 5.22-23. Scriptures that we are very familiar with. Okay. Okay. So what we're trying to establish, as the Word of God is teaching, as the Holy Spirit is showing us, is that first fruit should not be looked at in isolation. Ah. Should not be should not be viewed as something special in existence without any connection at all, because that's not how our God works. In part one, at the start, I, I informed us on a principle that we have discovered in the in the in the working of God, which is the principle of witness. The Lord places landmarks or symbols along the way, across the timeline with a specific intent to get our attention for us to know what he is doing with us at the time in connection to what he has planned to do in the future. So the main event will happen in the future. He has uh, instituted that within his promises, within the counsel of his will, that such and such event will take place as part of his eternal purpose. But then for us to know how to participate how to play a part in that event, or how to know the the event of that uh, uh, the situation, we need to be privy to it before it happens. Because our God works in such manner all the time. He declares the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He knows how it's going to happen, how it's going to end. But we don't know. So if He wants us to participate, He needs to give us enough information, substance of some sort, for us to be privy to it mm -hmm. because we have a part to play in it as well so the the, the, the witness principle go speaks to that uh, 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 effect that the lord is informing us on what he plans to do Why? in the future hence we have uh, we, we will know Why? what we need to do what our part Why? is in being involved in the in the process for what is to come to come for what is to happen in the future so the Lord Jesus Christ is the main subject in the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. That is the whole purpose of the Bible being written. Because God wanted to redeem mankind from the bondage of sin. And he made a promise that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent in indicating virgin birth. 
indicating that there will be a woman that will give birth to a son, a child, and that child will be a male child, mm -hmm. and that child will be a son of God. But it was a coded message that the Lord had pronounced, a prophecy he had made himself, declared himself in the Garden of Eden. It wouldn't have made any sense to anyone mm -hmm. if that was the only thing he ever said concerning the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So across the timeline, he sent prophets, he sent his word, he revealed the counsel of his word through certain dispensations by introducing covenants. And one of the main covenants he introduced was the covenant that he gave us at the hand, by the hand of Moses, the Mosaic covenant, which was a shadow of things to come. Okay. So the old covenant, which has been abolished by the way, doesn't exist anymore. Because he pointed to Christ Jesus the Messiah. So everything that we are dealing with in the kingdom of God. Because we've been, we've been given us the kingdom of God because we've come through Christ. For the Father to accept us. So we are the body of Christ. We are interwoven with Christ. There is no separation between us and Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head, we are the body. And we are members one of another. We are inseparable. Okay? So the sole purpose for us coming to the kingdom, or the, the, the basis for which for, uh, for, uh, for, for which we came into the kingdom, upon which we came to the kingdom, is Christ Jesus, what he accomplished. So God in, in God the Father saving us, he could not do it except through Christ Jesus. He's only begotten Son. So the Lord Jesus says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So if you receive the Son, that means you have also received the Father, the one who sent the Son. Then you will be passed from judgment to, to life. From sin to righteousness. From darkness to light. So what we are dealing with, with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is what it is, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not of anyone else. Him. So we cannot talk about tithing, uh, offerings, seed sowing, outside of Christ Jesus. We will run into errors, full stop. There is no one in this planet, nobody, no one who claims to stand for Christ, who has read the Bible 50 million times, who claim to have all the knowledge in theology, who can deny this fact. If you deny the fact that the, the, the Word of God, as we know it, from Genesis, as we have the, council, the written counsel of God, from Genesis to Revelations about Lord Jesus Christ, you've missed the whole point. It's not by Elijah, it's not by Elisha, it's not by Isaiah, it's not by Hosea, it's not by Abraham, it's not by Noah, it's about Jesus Christ. Amen. All those men that the Lord used, he used them as part of the process. But ultimately it is all about Christ Jesus. He is the firstborn, the first fruit. Meaning he is the pace setter, he is the progenitor. All of us came out of him. So he said to the Pharisees that Abraham sought to see my day and they felt that it was being uh, 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 un uh, unreasonable or illogical. So you were born only a few years ago. How can you say Abraham sought to see your day? Then he said to me, before Abraham, I am, not I was, I am. His Melchizedek who made Abraham when he came back from the slaughter of those kings that had captured Sodom and Gomorrah in other towns and uh, took Lot and his, uh, his family and, and belongings along, uh, along with them. For which reason Abraham went after them. Because he took his nephew. That same Melchizedek is the Lord Jesus Christ. King of Salem. King of righteousness. Without genealogy. That's him. Amen. To whom Abraham paid tithes to. So we're talking about Christ Jesus here. So as we continue in this series, giving and receiving, the principle to establish is, why did the Lord introduce his covenant? Why did he introduce his ordinances? He's expanding the counsel of his will to, to us for us to understand. 
but in connection to the Messiah, because that is where the solution to our main problem is, mankind. Our main problem is sin. That's the thing that divided us from God, introduced en enmity between us and God. That's the very thing that Lord God promised to, to, to do away with, to resolve, so that he can have us back. So that his original intent you know, will remain. He wanted to have fellowship with mankind forever. But eternity was promised to mankind. But man was given a choice to take up that offer. Because the Lord will not force himself on you. Our relationship with him is based on that merit. Choice. You have to choose him. Yes, by election he has chosen us, and the Bible tells us in, in, in John 15, 16, I, you did not choose me, but I, I chose you. Yeah. But that's by election he has chosen us, because he predetermined that when we receive the gospel, we should respond to him. That's God's you know, sovereignty at, 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 in, at, at work there. We can't question God for doing so. But when we come into contact with him, when we engage him in response to the call he has made to us, we still have to choose to serve him. Yes, yes, thank you Jesus. And so first fruit is not a distinct subject, it's not something to look at in isolation and to start commanding God's people in giving their first fruit. That is illogical, yeah, illegal. Yeah. So what we are doing, we're looking at the background of the concept, the background of the principle and the ordinance, because the first fruit is an ordinance. Yeah. And to see the context in which it was introduced under the old covenant. And then we'll conclude in terms of what it means to us in the new covenant and how do we apply it. If we need to apply it, that is. Okay. But I can give you, you know, a full thought that we don't need to apply in the new covenant because it is immaterial. Christ Jesus is the first fruit. So we don't need to give any first fruit. See? So the assemblage of the law of God that we have become accustomed with in terms of the old covenant was there to show us who God was, was a revelation of who God was, and how he is to be pleased. So the ordinances were set to show us how to please God. When he gives us his law, he's telling us, this is how you connect to me, this is how you relate to me. I like this, I don't like that. So do this, and we'll get on well. If you do the opposite, I'm upset, I'm angry with you, I will judge you. That's essentially what the Lord God was revealed to us for. To be our taskmaster, to tell us how to behave, how to respond to God, how to obey Him. The law of God is good. It converts the soul. It makes the simple, the foolish, wise. Nothing wrong with the law of God. We could not obey God's law because we have no strength. The flesh has no strength. The arm of flesh always fails. So the Lord knew that was the case, but we did not know. We had to be proven to be wrong. Therefore, cry for, for help. The same thing the Lord exemplified when he sent Israel to, into captivity in Egypt. To be enslaved for over 400 years. They got accustomed to, to the burden. They were doing okay. The Lord had to do something to make them call for help. He increased their burdens by going through their, 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 their taskmasters to say to them that now you're going to have to fetch the straw and work, make the bricks. The straw we used to strengthen the, 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 the construction of the bricks. But it's a long distance to go and fetch them. So the Lord did that deliberately 
so that the, the Israelites will cry for help because they were continued, they were they were comfortable now. Then they became comfortable in the in, 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 in enslavement because they were doing okay, it seemed. But God's plan was for them to come out of Egypt after the 400 years had, uh, had elapsed. But they were so comfortable, so the Lord increased their dreams. This is what the Lord will do. He need to give us a type, a form, something that we can relate to in order for us to understand what he is doing and where, where he is taking us. And this was very important for Christ Jesus, our Lord and Messiah, for us to know what exactly the Lord was doing at the time. So when Christ Jesus came onto the scene, the scholars that be at the time, you had the Sadducees, you had the, the, the Pharisees, you had the scribes, people that were knowledgeable in the scriptures. Every time they looked at the scriptures, say, okay, if you're the Christ, then this must happen as well. That must happen. That must happen. Because they knew how the events were going to unfold because the Lord had placed the landmarks. But because they were also blinded, they could not connect the Lord Jesus Christ with the scriptures because they were only looking at the political aspect of it. The struggle they, 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 they had experienced with the Roman uh, tyranny. And that's what they're looking at mainly. They thought it was based on the kingdom of this earth when it was about the kingdom of God. It was, it's always been about the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, we'll move on. Okay. Okay. Well, we also touched on the, the different feasts. And what they stand for. And it's very important for us to understand about these feasts. Why the Lord had placed them and marked them. Okay? And uh, I also remember mentioning that we need to look at. The Lord will give us grace um, um, sometime in the future. For us to explore the importance of numbers. That the Lord speaks in numbers a lot. What certain numbers stand for. He connects them to certain uh, principles of his. So when we see a number there. We should immediately uh, think about that particular principle. As a way of helping us. You know, uh, know by his will. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So we did read First uh, Corinthians fifteen twenty and twenty three, where we see the connection of first of, of the term first fruits in plural with the nest at the end with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we also read uh, in Revelation one uh, chapter one verse five and six where we see the term firstborn referring to Lord Jesus Christ as well. In the same context of resurrection. So we can conclude safely that the term first fruit and firstborn are related, are equal in status, are equal in description, and referring to the Lord Jesus Christ under the same premise. Okay? So, what we need to, to, to do now is to look at the principle of first fruit but under. The premise of the firstborn, because first and firstborn are equally are the same, really, because they're referring to Lord Jesus Christ in the same capacity. But we need to look at what the firstborn principle is, because the Lord introduced that under the same ordinance or first fruit. Yeah. Amen. So by doing so, we're going to read uh, some scriptures. And we thank the Lord for this opportunity to yeah. share His word. Oh, the revelation yeah. comes from Him. Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit, you're the one who gives them. So yeah. the words that we speak are not our words, oh. they are your words. Yes, so Lord. you deserve all the glory Amen. and praise. Hallelujah. We honor your name in yes, Jesus' Lord. name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so there is a key statement that we need to, to look at. The Lord pronounced this, He made this statement. Very, very important. Uh, the first scripture we're going to look at is in Exodus yeah. chapter 13. Verse 1 to 22. It's a long scripture, you know, very important. And the Lord, yeah. Exodus chapter 13, okay. 1 to 22. Yeah. yeah, I can read for us. Yeah. And the Lord spoke 
unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of men and of beasts, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hands the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no unleavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Etites and the Amorites and the Levites and the, Levite, the Jebutites, which he swore unto thy father to give thee the land flowing with milk and oil, that thou shalt that thou shalt keep this service in the months. The seventh day thou shalt eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day thou seventh day shall be feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And there shall be no leaven. There shall be no living bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be unle neither shall there be living seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in the day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand and for a memorial between thy eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth for with a strong hand as the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in the season from year to year. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he sworn unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord, unto the Lord all that openeth the mysteries, and every firstling that cometh of the beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's and every firstling of the house thou shalt redeem with a lamb and if thou wilt not redeem it then thou shalt break his neck and all the firstborn of men among thy children shall thou redeem and it shall be when the son thy son ask thee in the time to come saying what is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hands the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord sworn shown all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens, openeth the mattress, being male, being males, but all the firstborn of the children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thy hand and for a frontlet between the eyes, for by strength of hands the Lord brought us out of Egypt and it shall and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that the Lord that the God that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines although that was near for God says let this paraventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt but God led the people about 
through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up hardness out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bone of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bone away, hence with you. 20. And they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped in Eton in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in the pillar of cloud and to lead them the way, and day night in the pillar of fire to give them light to go day by day. And took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, for before the people. Amen. Amen. So in that passage, what I encourage you is to, to, get, uh, to get yourself in the habit of reading long passages. It's very, very important. Because one of the tricks of Satan is to discourage us, is, is to spew discouragement into the air around you. You know, so that you will not focus and concentrate on reading the Word of God. You should be able to sit down and read five chapters of a book. That's not an issue, really. You should be able to focus and read an entire book, the whole book of Genesis. You should be able to focus with the entire book of Jeremiah. Amen. Because the Word of God is there for us. It's been written for our benefit for our learning Amen. so the certain certain knows that's where the truth lies that's where the deliverance lies so that the knowledge lies everything is in there so it tries to discourage us you know so we need to be really really aware mm -hmm. sometimes you're thinking that the thoughts in your head are not thoughts that you've generated yourself because Satan has has a, the, the ability to to spew out poison in the air the mind the way the mind works the mind responds to the atmosphere within its vicinity. That's how the mind works. The mind seeks for knowledge and saps in information. The mind is, 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 is essentially spiritual. So not every idea that you hear, every uh, uh, word you hear, are necessarily coming from the Lord. They are not your ideas because you're not generating them necessarily. The flesh talks as well. So you need to make, be able to make, uh, to make that distinction. But anything that discourages you from activities that would in nourish your, 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 your spirit, that would uh, uh, enrich you spiritually and draw you close to the Lord, is of the, of the devil, is of the enemy. Mm. Yeah. Obviously, in, in learning, it does not necessarily mean that you have to um, uh, you know, accept everything that you hear. If somebody is speaking like I'm speaking to you now, you need to check what I'm saying against what the word of God is saying and your spirit, what the spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit is telling you within you, what you should receive or you shouldn't receive if you agree or you don't agree. Okay? So that is the response you have. Okay. Nobody should force you to learn anything except that you have consulted your master and he gives you permission. Amen. Amen. Okay. So in these scriptures, we have two Two statements in there, two key scriptures in there that are telling us what the law, why the Lord introduced the firstborn rule. Okay. In verse one of uh, uh, Exodus chapter twelve, the Bible tells us I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying. This month shall be the shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay. So the Lord was taking them out of Egypt, and He said, "Your life begins now." Comparatively to salvation, the new covenant, when you are a new creature, the Bible says, "All things are passed away; all things become new." Your start is now. Yeah. Then speak to all the congregation of Israel, chapter 3, saying, on the 10th of this month. Now, 
Number 10 there is quite important because the Lord instituted uh, Atonement Day to be on the 10th of the month Abib. Month Abib became month Nisan later. Just like I was going to month Nisan, the first month of the year in the Jewish calendar. But the Lord said Abib day into just Nisan instead afterwards. He called it Nisan. Yeah. The 10th. It was the 10th as well that the Lord instructed uh, Moses and Aaron to tell Israel to set apart the lamb for the Passover. Okay. And the lamb, the Passover, was then killed and uh, offered on the 14th, okay. twilight. Because at midnight, midnight was already the 15th, when the Lord would go into Egypt and kill the firstborn. So the 10th, which is the atonement day, so number 10 could stand for atonement. That's what I meant by the Lord using numbers as, as code for us to understand his principles. 10th for atonement, 14th for Passover. Okay. And 15th for the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. So Unleavened Bread and Passover are connected because they're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As the Lamb, obviously, because his blood will be shed, Unleavened because the body of Christ, which is represented in the in, in the bread, without leaven, because leaven in that context represents sin, so the bread is unleavened. But for the festival of the of the weeks or, or Pentacles, which is seven Sabbath days and one day, so seven seven days are seven times seven days, that's forty nine plus one day after this after after the seven weeks, it is Pentecost. For Pentecost, as part of the celebration of the first fruits, the Lord orders them to bring an offering, a meal offering, which has two, lo two uh, 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 loaves of bread, and those two are leaven made. They contain yeast in it, they contain leaven. Because leaven in that context represents growth, represent, represents success, represents experiencing the blessing the Lord has promised. So last, uh, the last session uh, we touched on the difference between the three uh, connotation of leaven. Leaven as sin, we see that in the Passover, that it should not be touched or or entertained or used in any form, and we see leaven as a connotation for growth and experience of the blessing the Lord has given in the first fruits during the Pentecost, and. The same context the Lord has used, the Lord Jesus has used as well, as well in the gospel to, to, to tell us about the kingdom of God. When he gave the example of the woman who sets uh, 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 different measures of, of, of barley to make, to make bread or to make cake, and he uses yeast and has that, uh, the yeast has the effect of blowing everything up. This is so is the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is about growth, it's about continuity, it's about progress, okay? it's about advancement. And another uh, connotation to love the Lord Jesus Christ gives us is doctrine. So he said to, 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 to his disciples, beware of the, uh, the leaven of the Pharisees. So referring to their doctrine. Because doctrine has that impact as well, has that uh, 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 potency to form you. It is formative. So if you receive the right doctrine, which is the doctrine based on Christ Jesus, you'll conform to his image. If you receive a doctrine of someone else, you conform to the image of that person because that person is indoctrinating you in what makes who they are. This is why we have so many problems in the body of Christ today because of the disparity of doctrines. There should only be one doctrine. Only one doctrine is recognized as the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, otherwise known as the, the Apostles' Doctrine because they inherited the Word of God from the, from the Lord Jesus and that's what they followed. They did not strive from it. So that's when you go through the, 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 the scriptures in, 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 the, in, in, in the, the letters of Paul, or what? Uh, Peter's written, John, James, Jude, you know, all of them. You will not, you not, you will not find a, a, a denom denominational uh, uh, a character there, a name of a church. Churches or assemblies were referred to by the town or cities they were based in. You won't find any other type of name that we've got today. 
an identity crisis we experience. Everybody's got a name for, you know, for the assembly. You won't find that now. There were no Baptists or Methodists or, or, or what have you. Because the doctrine is one. There should be any separation. And it is really baffling how we got here. Seriously. And we see how the scripture, we have the Bible in our hands, but yet we're continuing in the same path. That is even more worrying. I really wonder. I really do. Honestly. Yeah. Okay, we have technology issue here. Okay, I have to resolve this technology issue. Just a few minutes. You know, so... That's the thick connotation we can de uh, deduce from uh, the, the Word of God and how, how you know, uh, the things have transpired to us. You know, the distinction between uh, the, the leaven, the context in which leaven is, 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 is used. So what we're seeing in, 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 uh, in Exodus 12, uh, uh, 1, is the expression or the the importance attached to the idea or the concept of first form because it actually relates to Christ Jesus. Yeah. So what the Lord was saying that all firstborn are mine because he saved the firstborn of the Israelites when he killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians both man and, and, and beast. So in doing so, he used his own blood. I mean, he used the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, represented by the, the Passover lamb. So because he did that, therefore he had, he had illegally, he could claim all the firstborn. Mm -hmm. And he pursued that legal avenue. He said, all firstborn are mine. Whoever opens the, the womb first, when it comes out first, I claim them. Because I saved all the firstborns back in Egypt. So I put a legal basis to claim them, they're all mine. Okay. Why is that uh, important? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the firstborn. And the Bible tells us he's a begotten son of God. So the Lord, the Father claimed the Lord Jesus Christ. What I mean by begotten son? He laid claim that this is my begotten son, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. But the, terms, the term son of God actually means equality with God. Yeah. So when, it, when we talk about the, the, the status of, of Lord Jesus Christ as a firstborn, that's what it relates to every indication that the Lord the, 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 the word of God, the law of God, in the old covenant laid out for us. Everything, everything. That same claim the Lord made of all the first one of Israel was the same claim he made on the Lord Jesus Christ as his begotten son. Because the Lord did not give birth naturally to those firstborns in Israel. So when he claimed them, he begot them. That's what he did. All the first one are mine, he says, so he begot them. Because he, don't, he did not biologically give birth to them, although he's a creator. But in the legal context, for him to claim them, he had to present a, 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 a premise that was acceptable. So that premise was that I saved you, or your firstborn, when I killed the Egyptians. So I have a, a claim now because I was the one who kept you alive. If I did not do that, you would have died as well because I was judging. But he was able to make a separation between the Israelites and the Egyptians because he knew the Israelites were descendants of Abraham, his friend, one that he had a covenant with, the Abrahamic covenant. That covenant is based on Jesus Christ. That's the only covenant that has not been abolished. That's why we are the seeds of Abraham as well. Yeah. Right. So another scripture 
where there's a, a Baki statement on who, on, on the first form. Okay. So I'll just read up quickly. It's in, it's in Exodus chapter 12, but it's verse 16, just to, to make emphasis on. It shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontless between your eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So the Lord is reminding them here that you have to perform this requirement of you presenting your firstborn to me so that you remember I saved you. So the recognition that Christ died for us is something that we need to keep in mind permanently. We cannot stop thanking the Lord for what he's done for us. And we need to go into more details understanding what he's done for us. So that we, not de we do not neglect our salvation. Because when you do not understand what the Lord has done for you, it is difficult for you to appreciate it you know, as profoundly as it should. Right. Let's go another statement. In next uh, 34, I'll read that quickly. Okay. Uh, Exodus chapter 34, uh, verse 19 and 20. All that open the womb are mine. I'm reading from New King James Version. And every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep, or sheep, by the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem the lamb. And if you not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty handed. There's quite a lot in there. Okay? Right. So the Lord says, All the firstborn are mine. Okay? Male, firstborn, because the Lord Jesus Christ was to be a male. And it says that if it is a donkey, you can redeem the land. Okay. If you don't redeem it, then break his neck. Okay. So the Lord did not ask of all the animals the Lord asked to be given in in offerings, in sacrifices. The donkey was not part of it because of the the role the donkey plays. The donkey was there for service, so the donkey represents service. Because service to the Lord should not be interrupted. That means worship to the Lord should not be interrupted. So the Lord did not ask for the donkey. And it was a donkey that was used to carry the Lord Jesus Christ. That represents worship. It is only in worship that we can get that close with the Lord. And when we are serving the Lord, it is out of worship that we're doing whatever we do for Him. It is in close contact. It is out of love. So the donkey were not offered. So if you know we're going to redeem the donkey, break his neck. And then for human beings, the Lord said, you can redeem them. And we'll look at the redemption aspect, the firstborn principle, uh, further down the line. So how that happened. And in verse, in the last part of verse 20, it says, And none shall appear before me empty-handed. And we have to be careful how we use some of these scriptures in our time, in, in the New Covenant. Telling people, don't come before the Lord empty-handed. It doesn't mean that. That ordinance pertained only to the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. Not in the New. 
Because the firstborn being talked about there, the firstborn is the son of the son of man, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ as the firstborn. So when Christ Jesus presented himself before the Father in heaven when he ascended, before they were telling people not to touch him because he had not gone to the Father yet. He had to present himself to the Father with the evidence of what he had accomplished. But more importantly, the blood of sacrifice that he himself has shed to place here upon the mercy seat on the Ark of Covenant in heaven. The same Ark and the Tabernacle which Moses was given specific instruction to build according to that pattern. So the firstborn did not present himself empty-handed before the Father when he ascended to heaven. He went with the blood of his own, of, of the, his own blood that he sacrificed for us. So that was exemplified here when the Lord said the firstborn, the male firstborn should not present himself before the Lord empty-handed. It is all in context. That's what we keep saying. You have to look at Christ Jesus against the background of everything you read. If you don't, you'll run into all sorts of errors. You'll be saying, asking people to do things because you think it's in the Word of God, therefore it must be applied. But you've not sent somebody to go to the zoo to fight, fight with the lion. It's in the word of God. Something falls with the, with the lion. Why not send people to the zoo to go and fight with lions? Because it's in the word of God. So it is a ridiculous logic to use. Because in the word of God we must apply it. You need to understand the context, the will of God, the God's eternal purpose. Then you know how to apply it. If you don't understand that, you'll just be doing things for the sake of doing them. But you'll be able to be practicing. Amen. Right. So, the Lord also introduced um, uh, another uh, um, connotation to the law of firstborn, where it shows that there is privileges. There are privileges, pardon me. Yeah. So, the firstborn is preferred because the firstborn owns the birthright yeah. because they're born first and the Lord Jesus Christ as the son of man was the first son of Mary Mary had other children the Lord Jesus Christ had brothers Jude Apostle Jude was one of his brothers yeah. biologically yeah. but it was the first it was the first to come out so just as the Lord had claimed all the children of Israel the Lord Jesus Christ also claimed but the Lord called him his begotten son yeah. Not born, but begotten. Why he laid a claim on all the firstborn? Yeah. Like we said before, he laid a claim on the firstborn because he saved the firstborn of Israel based on the land, the blood of the, the perfect Lamb of God who was also himself with the firstborn. So the firstborn of Israel were all begotten by God because the Lord had presented a legal premise to claim them, saving them. From the death that had declared and declared for all the firstborn in Egypt. Okay? So, what else can we learn about the firstborn? The Lord instituted the law on how to deal with firstborn, how to recognize their preference, how to recognize their, 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 their special attention to be given to them, you know, how unique they were. And they instituted an ordinance to support that. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 15 and 17, I'll read. Yeah. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved, the true firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn wow. by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Okay? So the Lord is talking about 
three things in there, uh, uh, importantly, three key things in there. The right of the firstborn. It says that there will be situations where a man has two wives, and the, 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 there were those that had more than two, or more than three, back then. And it says that if one is not loved, meaning, you know, the preference, the man, the, the husband does not give that one much attention, but loves the other one better, but the one now receives less attention from her husband, you know, gives birth to, gives birth first, and the firstborn is a male, that person, that firstborn, that male child of the unloved wife, will receive the birthright of the first and be the firstborn. And when inheritance is shared, as the firstborn, you receive his due portion, which is double. So this is where we learn about the double portion. You hear people been saying it for years in the body of Christ: double portion, double. And we're we'll praying, asking for double portion. Yeah. The Lord instituted that with reference to the firstborn as an indicator that we will recognize Christ is the firstborn. We'll see that later, that double portion idea, how it applies, applies to Christ. But what we have access to the kingdom of God now is more than double. We don't need to ask double, double uh, portion of, of, of everything because the Lord has given us everything. So there is no need for asking for double. But people still pray that prayer, double portion, and what have you. Yeah. There's no harm in saying that, but we need to understand what we say because the Lord deals with understanding. Yeah. He doesn't accept ignorance. He doesn't accept foolishness. He doesn't. If you don't have wisdom, we have access to, to it. We ask him, he gives it to us. Yeah. So this is what the Lord instituted, that every firstborn will receive double portion of the inheritance. When inheritance is shared, the firstborn receive double portion. Regardless whether that firstborn is from the unloved or the loved. But the Lord made the emphasis here so that the no one becomes inconvenienced or disadvantaged because of you know pure sentiment. That's what the law of God does. It goes beyond human sentiment, human view, point of view, to ensure that there is equity. And nobody can apply equity better than God. We have laws of the land that intend to do that, but they go far, you know. Far enough in, 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 in dealing in, 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 in such manner, but still it's difficult to satisfy everyone. everyone. But with, the, with, with God, you can't complain really. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, and the Lord also added, under the same principle, it also talks about talks about the, how to deal with firstborns of, of animals in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 15 verse 19 the Bible tells us all the firstborn males that come from your herd and your flock you shall sanctify to the Lord your God you shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd nor shear the firstborn of your flock but what would you do with them you and your household shall eat before the Lord your God year by year in the place which the Lord chooses. So the Lord said the firstborn of your flock, because you've sanctified them, they are used in sacrifices in the meal. That meal will be the Passover, where the Lord Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. So the firstborn animal that is representative of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. That's when the Lord is choosing a place where that lamb, that animal was to be eaten ceremonially. 
So the price of the Lord Jesus Christ was to be sacrificed was predetermined. Golgotha, the place of skull, chosen by God. That was the price that was going to be had. Outside the sea, where everybody could see him, everybody knew that yes, he hung on the cross. Yes, he died. It was evidence that yes, that was him. So no detail is for the sake of just being there. It's with reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Moving on. Numbers 3, 12 and 13. The Bible tells us, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Yeah? Therefore, the Levites shall be mine because all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine, I am the Lord. And the Lord is saying here now, I'm going to trade with you. So he's introducing another uh, uh, subject, uh, uh, subject here, another principle here for us to understand. You know, propitiation or substitution. He says, I'm going to take the Levite, because I, I own the firstborn anyway. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the Levite in place of the firstborn. Yeah, and they will be mine. I'll appoint them for, serv for service. Because all the firstborn are mine. But I'm going to give you, you know, um, as, as it were, uh, a way out to lessen the burden on you for your firstborn. Yeah. The sons, that is. The animals so carry on as the Lord has instituted. They should uh, 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 use them for sacrifice, but they will consume their sacrifice anyway. They will not put them to work or, 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 or touch them or remove anything from them because they were sanctified, they were holy appointed for a specific uh, uh, assignment because they were representing the perfect Lamb of God himself, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was to be perfect without blemish, in whom the, the Son in whom the Father is well pleased. Okay. But the Lord then exchanged the first ball using the, the principle of redemption or, or, or uh, ransom instead of having to, to keep the first one of Israel, he gave them back and took the Levite. But, but he required compensation. We'll see that, about that later. That's what the redemption is, the compensation. When somebody, you know, in, in the world of crime, we, you know, we've come to understand some of these things, you know, illegal, of course they are. When somebody gets, you know, abducted by a, a, a gang of, you know, of criminals with malicious intent and they place a ransom that if you want to get this person back this is how much you should pay obviously they're using that principle wrongly you're better being arrested by God or kidnapped by God that's the best place to be mm. but people are running away from the Lord The Lord Jesus says, my burden is light. Then you shall find rest for your soul. When people are running away from you. Giving all sorts of excuses why they shouldn't give their life to Christ. It's not a risk you're taking. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Right. So, we'll give some examples of how people understood first of all, and uh, we'll touch on certain key uh, 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 areas or scriptures where this idea of first of all is ex exemplified, and what portion each individual you know used, and how it worked in their favour because they were they were you know acquiescing to God's will in in, in applying the law of first of all now. Okay, the first example is. In 1 Samuel 1, verse 1 to 28, you read about the story of Hannah there. Okay? You, you can read it in your own time. Now, another long scripture to read, which is quite encouraging. Okay? But we learn later that Hannah you know, made...
made a vow to the Lord. You know? Truthful. Truthful. Yeah. So in verse 11, the Bible tells us, then she, that's Hannah, uh, verse 11 of uh, 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 1 Samuel chapter 1, then she made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Yeah. We know the story of Hannah, she'd been childless for a long time. From the, the social construct, it, it transpires that she would have been the first wife, and uh, her, uh, her arrival, uh, uh, Benina, or Benina, was the second wife. One of the reasons some, uh, sometimes people marry uh, second wives is because they want to have children. If the, the first wife is not producing children, they get a second wife to have children. But we're not saying that's the context in which you know, that happened. So Benina had children. She was giving birth you know, regularly without any, 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 any uh, you know, any inhibition, any, any problems at all, any challenges, any barriers. You know, she freely gave her. A woman was working, you know, perfectly. Jesus. But Hannah had difficulties to conceiving. So she sought the Lord Jesus. on a number of occasions. She continued uh, participating in worship. They had to travel to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was placed. And at the time, Eli was a high priest, and his, and his sons were... The, um, the priest in support of, of, of the service. She prayed for many years, really she did. And uh, the Bible tells us here, Elkanah did something regularly. Elkanah gave his wife Hannah because he loved Hannah more than he loved Penina. So when they went to sacrifice as part of worship uh, before the Lord, at Sheila, he will give his wife double portion. He will give all the ch his children, uh, 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 all, the, all, all, all his, uh, um, um, his members of his family, you know, something to give as part of the uh, the worship. But he will give his wife uh, Hannah a double portion. So he understood the idea, understood the principle of double portion, that he referred to a preference. A right somebody earns and you give them to show that you class them above you know others Jesus. and Hannah prayed the Bible says in, in verse 11 Jesus. and made a vow to the Lord that the Lord if you give me a male child I'll give him back to you in service and that male child will be yours and it is interesting that the Bible talks about vow and Hannah mentions about the fact that the child will be a Nazarene, meaning that his hair will not be cut for the rest of his life. And we're going to touch on vows and pledges when the Lord gives us grace in the future to see what they mean. But when a Nazarene completed their vow, they will cut their hair and give that as part of the offering in, in the, in the and uh, as, 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 as we're indicating the ordinance for it. Quite interesting. Yeah. But it's all connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said that he was a Nazarene. That's what the, you know, we knew it to be Jesus Christ of Nazareth. His hair was not touched at all. It was not cut. Okay. He kept his hair as it was from birth until he, he completed the work that he came to do. He was never shaved once because he's a Nazarene. Yeah. And Hannah talks about the vow and mentions that and mentions about and connects to the law of the firstborn because Samuel would have been Hannah's firstborn 
Not Elkanah's firstborn, but Hannah's firstborn because Hannah had not given birth before. Samuel was the first child Hannah gave birth to, and she was her firstborn and promised her to the Lord. So what Hannah had done was recognizing that her firstborn belonged to the Lord anyway. And that's what the Lord was waiting for. He said, brethren, when we pray, it is important that we recognize the will of God. If we don't understand God's will, we will not pray all right, we'll pray amiss, we'll ask amiss. This is what James tells us. We pray to consume it on our lusts. That's why we do not get answers. But when we pray according to God's will, it happens. Because it means that there is provision for those things that we're asking for. The Lord had already planned them in. So we seek his will to know what he has in store already. So Hannah did that. The Lord was looking for some for a prophet. Because of the trouble that was happening in, uh, in Eli's life. Remember when the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines? Eli died of a heart attack. Fell backwards in the chair and died. His daughter-in-law gave birth. Um, you know, um, a premature birth when they heard that the, the ark was stolen because the glory of God had left Israel. That means that's it. There's nothing left. If you take the glory of the Lord from them, they had no cover. So they understood the implication of that. So, you know, the, 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 the repercussion was that the shock caused such turmoil. Death on one side and, and a premature birth. And the Lord was looking for someone. And if we read further in chapter 3 of the first Samuel, the Bible tells us that the word of God was scarce. The Lord hadn't spoken to anyone until Samuel was uh, a lad, a young lad, maybe 12 or 13, heard the voice of God. So all this time that Hannah was praying for a child, the Lord was quiet. In Israel, nobody heard his voice. There was no prophet. But he, his, he had, in his plan, Samuel was the one he was going to use. And he was waiting for Hannah to pray correctly. For Hannah to recognize. So sometimes the Lord will stretch us until we say the right things. But you need to understand that when you, when you are prayed, it is not because you pray that the Lord has given you something. It's because he responded to his will. God, our God, does not do anything else but his own will. He does not perform anybody's bidding. You cannot force God to do things. It's impossible. You cannot hold him captive or handsome or threaten him. You can't do that. You cannot command him. He is God. You don't tell him what to do. Don't be arrogant. People are asking God to do something for them. Lord, do this. Lord, do that. It's not your errant person. It's not your servant. It's your God. You need to show reverence to him. That's what you need to do. So when Hannah prayed and recognized God's will in that the firstborn of Israel, any firstborn belonged to God, he said so in, his, in her prayer. So, Lord, I'll give her back to you. So, what should implied legally is because he will belong to you because he's a firstborn. He's my firstborn. He's a male. He's yours. She conceived. And she kept to her vow and gave Samuel. She, she left Samuel at Shiloh. She used to come regularly to bring change of clothes because the child was growing. But the child said was, was left at Shiloh, Eli, until he grew to a, 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 an adolescent and he continued the ministry. But what happened to Hannah after that? She had many more children because she did what was compatible with God's will. See? By recognizing the importance of the law, the firstborn. So my brother, my sister, everything that we get from the Lord God, 
does not come to us because we are we've done whatever it's not because of any seed you've sown which you should stop doing anyway it's ridiculous it doesn't bear any any importance in the new covenant it's not because of any offering offering is actually not what people do nowadays that's not offering that's just giving money away offering is what we learn about in the, in the Old Testament those are the offerings what we do now is not offering it's something else it's giving money away that's what it is yeah. it's not because of all that Whatever we get, we see from the Lord Christ because of Christ Jesus, the firstborn, the begotten Son of God, in whom the Father was well pleased. It's through Him that we have received eternal life, through Him that we receive acceptance and been brought into the beloved adoption of sons. We receive sonship, we experience fatherhood because of Christ Jesus. Everything that we receive is because of Him. Amen. Another example is Elisha in, in, in 2 Kings chapter 9 to, to 15. The Bible tells us, And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what may I do for you? Behold, I am taken away from you. Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Elisha asked because he understood the principle of the, the first form. So he asked for a double portion because the double portion, as we read before in, in Deuteronomy, that the Lord has said that a first form who has the birthright should receive a double portion. So Elisha was asking him that because he was the first born of his family. Yeah. So Elijah replied, so he said, you have asked a hard Thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Okay. Okay. So we just jump to, to let's read 11 and 12. Okay. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. It was ruptured. And Elijah saw it. And he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he looked, he looked and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. So, uh, into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had Fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the God of Elijah? And when he also uh, when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that way, and Elijah crossed over. Because this is what Elijah did on the way on the way up. He struck his mantle, the water divided, the Jordan divided, and the water on dry land to the other side and, and then the Jordan recombined and then it, on, on his turn now uh, Elisha also does the same thing but Elisha did not know the God of Elijah that, 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 that well so he was asking where is the God of Elijah and that was the last time that Elisha asked that question because then he became acquainted with that God himself he became his God okay. this is what we need to do brethren we need to understand the God that we serve wants us to have a personal relationship with him, to know him for ourselves on an individual basis. Don't try and know God through someone else and calling the, um, the, call, the God of this, the God of that. No, it is your, he is your God. Yes, he says he shall be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob for a generation because the covenant he had with Abraham, the promise that he made. But he is your God. Amen. So we, we, we'll see how, actually, um, there's another verse in that chapter that I want us to, to look at. Because Elijah told Elisha, he said, if you see me going, then what you've asked will be given to you. And he saw him go. Okay? So we need to see, okay, did that happen or not? Okay. 
So Elijah, Elijah now parted the water of Jordan and walked across dry land as well, and appeared on the other side. In 15, we, 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 the Bible tells us, Now when the sons of the prophets who were, who, who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Now they used to have the sons of the prophets, or the school of the prophets, you know, to raise um, uh, you know, a young prophet into ministry, who the Lord had called. So usually the Lord used to, what he used to tend to do, when he called the prophet, if the prophet was married, the wife also be a part of the call. As for Isaiah, for instance. Isaiah referred to his wife as a prophetess. Yeah. And the children they produce, they also have the, that, 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 that call upon their lives. We learn that also in, 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 in Acts. Um, um, a disciple who had seven daughters, he prophesied, and all his daughters also prophesied. So, brethren, I mean, I've seen this, I don't call myself a prophet in any way, but I've had my daughters sit prophet, in the prophesying. You know, and uh, even at a young age, I remember once my, my eldest daughter, she's, she's 14 now, you know, she was, I think, was four and a half or five. One day in the morning, we're getting ready. Going to go to to join another version in in in, 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 the, in the service, and she walks into me and says, "Me, Daddy, Jesus is coming back." You know. So, so they will prophesy. And you might have a dedication to you as well if you your son, your daughter prophesy. Maybe you know the Lord is trying to tell you something. Yeah. If, if if that prophecy gives a prophet exists in the family. It would be on quite a few people, not just one person. You know, so watch out for that as well. That's one of the ways the Lord worked with that. Yeah. Okay. So here, the sons of the prophet looked at Elisha and recognized that the spirit of Elijah was upon him. But Elijah had gone up to heaven. He did not die. So how could his spirit stay on earth and be upon Elisha. See, what they saw was what the Lord revealed to them to see that the prophetic, um, uh, I want to use the prophetic anointing because that term has, has been abused a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The call of the prophetic was upon him. Yeah. It was always upon him because the Lord had told Elijah to call him, to call Elijah to replace him. But Elijah, Elijah, when Elijah uh, 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 made that call to Elijah, he did not give him the details. Yeah. And all the sons of the prophet, they all knew that day Elijah was taken away because there was a prophecy about that. They knew. The, one, the ones like a Gilgal, or Bethel, or Jericho, they all knew, all the sons of prophets, they all knew that it was going to be taken away that day. So it's, Elisha also knew. Yeah. So he received what he asked. And if you look at the miracles that Elisha accomplished, we must them against what Elijah accomplished, you can see that they are double. Twice what Elijah accomplished to what um, Elijah accomplished. So he had received what he had asked for because it was within his right as, as a firstborn to be given double portion. That law was instituted by God Himself, so He will obey it because it's His law. He will follow it, it's His word. The law of God doesn't go against His own, his own principle. Okay? Well, I will be. We're bringing, bringing this to a close. We know the story of Jacob and Esau. I can read that in Genesis 25, 29 to 34, when Rebekah was pregnant with the, with the two sons. And the Bible says that 
uh, the Bible says that he, she, she felt there was a struggle in her womb and sought the Lord. So why is a struggle? The Lord said that there are two nations in there. The, young, the, the older shall, shall serve the younger. She kept all that in her heart. She knew what it meant. So when the, 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 child, the children were born and grew, Jacob was close to her mother, his mother. Esau was close to his father. But Rebecca did not tell Isaac about what the Lord had told her. But the Bible says she kept that in her heart. So when the time came, and she shared some of this secret with Jacob about the birthright, what it meant. And Jacob pursued the avenue and bought and purchased the birthright because with the birthright, everything followed. Whoever has the birthright takes everything. And Jacob obtained it legally. He gave the soup, received the birthright. And Esau got up from the, the eating and, you know, as if nothing had never, no, ever happened. And the Bible said that this is how he despised his birthright. And when the time came for the blessing that was pronounced to, to, be, to be dispensed, the, birth, the blessing would follow the person who had the birthright. You can pronounce it on anybody from morning till night. Nothing will happen. You only follow the one who has the birthright because that's what the Lord God had instituted. It was in his law. All that was not revealed in the context it was revealed before, but it still existed there. So Jacob carried the birthright, all he was the youngest, but he was served by the, the elders because the birthright followed him because he purchased it legally. So when he asked the Lord to bless him, give him another blessing, the Lord did not give him another blessing. Because he felt that he had stole, stole the blessing from his brother, but he did not steal it. He acquired it legally. He gave him soup. He gave him the birthright. It was a legal exchange. You will see how Jacob's life then turned down because he had the birthright, because he carried the blessing of Abraham yeah, to perpetuate the lineage that will bring out uh, the Messiah. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in conclusion, our Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Son of Man as well. And uh, we're going to see examples of Him being the firstborn as well. Yeah. And we touched on some, we touched on some key, key important um, concept, you know, connected to the first ball, there is the, 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 the birthright, and that birthright places a certain, a certain uh, value, a certain worth, a certain separation on the person who carries it. And in recognition of that uh, birthright, being the first ball, when inheritance is given out, they get a double portion. Yeah. So uh, the scripture we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 1. Verse 1 to 17. The Bible tells us, The book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So he starts to tell you where Christ Jesus uh, came from, as the son of man. Okay? The son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah, and Judah his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Perez begot Ezron, and Ezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot. Uh, Nashon, and Nashon begot Solomon, Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. Yeah. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah, that's Bathsheba. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot uh, Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah, Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Ezekiah, Ezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, Amon begot Josiah, Josiah begot Jeconiah, and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. 
And after they were brought back, they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shitio, and, and Shitio begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abu, Abu begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim. It carries on. Okay? And we get to Nathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. I know sometimes reading this genealogy can seem tedious. But the reason why they don't put the details there is so that we will learn you know, about who is who. Okay. Okay. So 17, the Bible says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David, David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. So we're talking from Abraham to David, from David to, to, to Sheltiel, and from Sheltiel to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, 14 generations in between. Okay. Why 14? It is not a coincidence, because Christ Jesus is the firstborn. Fourteen is double of seven. Seven is the number of God. Why? Because God rested on the seventh day. Okay. So, in Christ being the Son of God, the firstborn, he gets double portion as well. Because the double portion was instituted with that very idea in mind. To point to Christ Jesus. So his arrival had that connection to it of double portion. Okay. So 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. Three times. And number three stands for resurrection. They also stand for the Godhead or Trinity. Right? So if you read Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, the Bible tells us about how God rests on the seventh day. So when the Lord instituted the Sabbath, being the seventh day, the day of rest, because he wants his people to also enjoy rest, the rest that he enjoyed since he created the world. This is why we have to be careful when we are praying, we are taught to pray, to ask the Lord to do things. God rested from me all his work. We want him to work. We're asking the Lord to, you know, to do things for us. He has done all those things already. It is for us to do those things that have been given unto us to do, the works. Not for the Lord to be doing them. Healing the sick is for us to do. Raising the dead is for us to do. Miracles is for us to work. That's what we, we are for in the kingdom of God. We'll be empowered with the Holy Spirit to do that. Not to be asking God to do things for us. He rests in the seventh day. So seven is the number of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. The Bible says he's the express image of God. The word that was in the beginning. The word was with God, the word was God. The word became flesh, Christ Jesus. We read in the second, second Philippians 2, I said that he did not consider it uh, uh, something to hold on to. To be God, to be equality of God, but abased himself. You know. He accepted the position of a common person. So he gave up all that glory, all that fame, all that, um, um, not necessarily the fame, the fame was, was uh, was trapped in him anyway. He gave up the glory, so he was not born in the palace. It was not born in the palace. It was born in a stable where animals live. That's where he was born. The king of all kings, the one who created the whole world. Born as a human being, he gets born in a in a manger. The manger in a stable. You know, they couldn't find a place for him to be born. Not even a little hat. He has to be where animals. Are. He accepted that. That's what he means. Okay? So we see that he's the firstborn. 
So the idea of the firstborn was introduced in regard to him. So all that we have we've been reading, studying about in the first fruit context is to do with Christ Jesus. So the, the, the idea of giving first fruit is what we need to challenge because where does it sit in the new covenant? What ordinance do we have in the new covenant? Because the new covenant has superseded or subsumed the old covenant because the old covenant, covenant was a shadow of things to come. The real thing has come so we are in a better covenant with better promises. So we cannot go back to the covenant that does not exist anymore and start practicing it. When Christ has already fulfilled the law that was given under that same covenant, that means it's case closed. So but why do we practice it then? Amen. So we'll conclude. We'll conclude next time. As the Lord gives us grace as he always does. And um, we'll learn even more. Because the Holy Spirit is in the business of teaching us. Amen. Amen. So stay blessed, brethren. And uh, continue, you know, in your service unto your God fervently. And uh, remember that God loves you dearly. And he has the best, you know, uh, plans for you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's in your, your interest, you know, your concerns, your, 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 your worries. You shouldn't worry anyway, but when you do, it touches him, mm -hmm. okay? And any pains you, you, may, you may experience, he feels it as well. The Bible tells us that we have a high priest who's touched by the feelings of infirmity, you know. He feels it when you're hungry, when you're desperate, he feels it, you know. So don't run away from it. Go to him and express yourself to him. Say, Lord, I'm hungry. Oh, Lord, I feel, I feel tired. You know, Lord, give me strength. That's what he's for. He'll give you strength. You're not commanding him. You are interacting with him. You, you are uh, uh, engaging with the Holy Spirit. That's what you are doing. You're always thinking about praying, asking him to go and do things that is not in the same context when you are interacting with him. You're asking the Lord, Lord, touch me, Lord. You know, wrap me with your, your arms of love. He wants that. That's what the Lord wants. He wants that communion with you. you know, he, he will give up anything. He has done so to have, you know, um, a communion with you, to spend time with you. Amen. Amen. So stay blessed, even as you are blessed, with the seed of Abraham, and let your week be fruitful as the Lord has yeah. indicated it will be. Fruitfulness means success, Amen. and multiplication means unstoppable gain. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So enjoy your week. Stay blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.